Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Um, we're moving straight on with Nicholas Vegstein's talk about uh, GRIT testing. Uh, Nicholas joined Google two years ago uh, here as an SET and is now working out in Sydney, one of the perils of having to work for Google, um, where they have nice weather, apparently, and it's warm. Uh, but he's come back here just to give this talk to you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. Oh. All right, hello everybody. Um, yes, I'm Nicholas. I'm uh, an SET working on Google Wave, um, and I've started working on Google Wave uh, a little while ago. And before that, um, I worked here in Zurich on different projects. Most of them, or a lot of them, involving GWT. Uh, GWT is the Google Web Toolkit. Um, and while working on those applications, um, I learned a lot about how um, to write a grid application, but also how not to write a grid application. And this is a little bit what I want to talk about uh, during this talk. So we're in this brave new world where the web is not anymore just used for um, content. Um, the web is more and more becoming our platform for writing applications. Um, especially here at Google, we like it a lot. It has a lot of advantages. You know, you don't have to um, burn CDs and ship them out to people. Um, people just log on from wherever they are. They don't need to install anything on their machines. So it's um, a really great um, uh, environment, but it comes with a certain problems, right? So one of the problems, or a couple of the problems that we have, is that we need to reinvent the entire set of developer tools, which we already had. Um, you know, for Java, for C++. Actually, I guess this industry has gone through a couple of um, circles like that where we had to reinvent our tools. Um, this is the latest one. Um, but also we have to deal with some new challenges, right? So certainly our software has to run in browsers, which are all sort of more or less compatible to each other um, on different operating systems. What's happening now very recently is that we even want to run those applications on our um, mobile devices um, or just smaller uh, PCs like the netbooks, which have a very limited uh, CPU and memory resources, right? And what also is happening is that the, the type of connection that we have available is changing as well, right? So suddenly you don't know if um, this laptop could be hooked up over a wire, over Wi-Fi, or over a 3G card, or whatever, the characteristics of the connections differ. So these are all things you have to take into consideration today if you want to write a web application. Um, this is why GWT is your friend. Um, because basically, it is a layer that takes away a lot of these problems and deals with them for you. Or at least that's the idea. So um, it lets you write. For those, uh, so who in here doesn't know GWT or has never seen GWT? Oh, excellent. Everybody knows GWT. Fantastic. All right. So it gives us the, the chance to work um, with a tool set that is, has been used in the Java world for many years and has been developed in that world for many years. So it's quite mature. It's versatile. There's tons of debuggers and IDEs and lots of, I don't know, code coverage tools and whatever you wish for. Um, whether this is an advantage or not um, is a topic of discussion, I guess. We're not going to get into it here. I think it is an advantage. Um, and GWT, as I mentioned, will handle for you the incompatibilities between um, the browsers. And it will even be able to generate JavaScript code that might be more efficient than the JavaScript code that you would develop by hand because it's... Um, takes your Java code and cross-compiles it to JavaScript so you can do nice things like method inlining or removing that code or all these kind of things. Um, there's built-in support for internationalization and accessibility. And one of the later things um, that was introduced is that we can have on-demand code downloading, which means that only the parts of JavaScript that are being used right now are being downloaded into the, into the browser, which is especially useful if you have mobile clients. 
All right, so this is the shiny new world of GWT. Since you've all seen GWT applications before, I hope I'm just going to go through this very quickly. This is a very simple uh, web application that um, looks a little bit like the Google search uh, page. Um, it contains um, a text box and a button in good Google tradition and uh, a label where we're going to put our results. What you can see is that we set up our service. We set up all our different panels. We can display this whole thing. And here's the method that will um, put some logic into our application. So when somebody clicks on the search button, we want to shoot off this query and display the, re display the results that come back. So it's all nice and shiny. And for those of you who have written Swing applications or uh, have worked on other, um, on other similar GUI toolkits, we'll, uh, we'll find this very familiar. So that's all nice and good. But how do we test all of this? Um, there are basically a couple of ways of how we can test with applications. Um, the one that probably most people are familiar with is WebDriver or similar tools like Selenium or Rational Robot or plenty more out there. Um, these tests have the big advantage that they're very realistic. They test the system, how it actually is, like a user would use it. Unfortunately, they are relatively slow, and it, is, it can be very hard to maintain them, depending on how your application is written. And I think we're going to hear maybe something about that from the developers of these tools on how to make them uh, these tests more main, or more easy to maintain. But in general, my experience has been that it's quite hard to maintain them. And also, it's quite hard once you find a problem to pinpoint the line of code that you actually have to change to make it work. This is a big end-to-end -end test, right? So um, what the GWT toolkit gives us is the GWT test case, which is basically a Java unit, uh, sorry, yeah, a J unit test case that is cross-compiled as well into the JavaScript world and executed against the JavaScript version of your application. This is a bit less realistic than running a web driver test. It runs faster. It still requires a lot of compilation, though. Um, it's easy to maintain. And the debugging, again, we're sort of not quite sure, because what we see is a line of JavaScript code that tests another line of JavaScript code and finds a bug, but actually we have to fix the Java code that's behind it. Right? So um, this is basically why we, what we found um, at Google is that what we really want is to run write a lot of our tests in JUnit and execute them in Java against the Java version of this grid application. It has a downside that is probably not the realistic, most realistic approach, but it's very fast. It means you can write a lot of unit tests. You can use all your existing tools that you know for code coverage, um, maybe even automatic test generation or whatever you do in Java. Um, and it is probably the closest to uh, pinpointing about. It basically just has all the benefits of traditional unit testing. So this is what we set out to do. We went into different projects and tried to convince them that this was the way to go and started looking into their applications to see um, how hard it would be or how easy to make this possible. And here are a couple of the problems. So the biggest problems, I think, that, um, that we found. So one of the first problems we found is that since we're dealing with AJAX applications, and I should mention that some of this is basically applies to any sort of development. So that includes development of traditional web applications, maybe what are you using uh, JavaScript, PHP, or whatever, you will run into very similar problems. Um, one of them is the nature of these applications. So the, the A in AJAX, the asynchronous bit, makes development a lot more painful, generally. So we end up with things like this where um, what we do here in line number three, we, we, we make a query to our back end, to our server, and we, we have to define um, a callback that will be called once the server decides to give us an answer, or maybe never. So 
um, inside this callback, there's this onSuccess method, which then will does a whole lot of complicated stuff, right? There's a lot of complexity in there. There's some ifs and elses and for loops and switches and whatnot. And this is basically the part of the application that we would like to see tested. Now, with a traditional test, you will have to use something like a mocking framework to even get an, a hold of this anonymous inner class that was created. Before you can even start executing that anonymous inner class, you'll have to execute all the code down to line 12. And this is where you can actually start your test. Very annoying. There's a very simple solution, though. Just take this callback, and in onSuccess method, you call another method, which is not inside this scope that is hard to access. And suddenly, your test becomes a lot easier. There's no more capturing of, uh, of anonymous classes or anything. We don't even need a service anymore to test our class. We can basically just generate a fake response and make sure using traditional uh, unit testing approaches that this is, does what we want it to do. Um, the second problem we ran into um, is that the developers sort of tend to, they start working with GWT, they start liking it. Um, GWT basically provides with a whole API of different widgets um, and different ways to lay out things on your web page. And sometimes they're just a bit too lazy to find out exactly what GWT provides them with. So they think, huh, that's um, not really a problem because with GWT I can also access the DOM, so the, the, the basically, yeah, the, the page directly and just do it there and not bother which is nice and a quick way to do things. Um, but of course it has a problem that it becomes completely untestable in the Java world because the Java world doesn't have a DOM that only exists in, uh, in the compiled application. And again, there's a pretty simple solution to this. Learn the API. Um, it provides you with a lot of the stuff that you need. And if it doesn't, if you really have to write your own widgets that uh, are not supported, then separate them into a nice class so that later on you can mock it. The problem, basically, which maybe I should uh, mention, is that it's very hard to instantiate these things um, in the Java world. This list box doesn't really exist, right? We'll have to replace it with something that just looks like a list box but isn't actually there. And but for functional testing, that should be enough. Um, the third problem we ran into is very similar, is that people tend to mix Java and JavaScript. So, um, yeah, I found, I found, this is something we found in a lot of places. Basically, GWT allows you to write um, native Java methods, which only have an implementation in JavaScript, again, works perfectly fine if you cross-compile all of your code into JavaScript. But if you're trying to test in Java, sorry, there is just no implementation. So we cannot test it. Um, so here's an example of um, an application where maybe uh, we want to have two YouTube players on a page, and we would like one start button for both of them. So that would start both videos at the same time. Um, one way to implement such a thing would be uh, this piece of code, which creates um, this button. And you can see, again, down here, deep down in this button, we call this method called start both players. And at the bottom, you can see what a native JavaScript method looks like in GWT. Um, very simple, but again, we can't really test any of that in Java. This um, Java will tell us that this method doesn't have an implementation. Uh, we can't execute it. So if we want to do something like this, pack it into a separate widget and make sure you can replace that with something, uh, with a mock during your test. And the fourth problem is, again, it's basically a very general problem. And 
it, it applies to practically every kind of unit testing. It is that in general what we want to do is we want to have this class on the test and we want to poke it from our test case and we want to see if it does what we think it should do. Um, now if this class on the test uses a lot of static stuff or of global data, we end up with something like this usually, where a class on the test suddenly depends on all these things that, um, that we will just have to deal with in our test case, right? Um, we might have to set up some of those classes to have the right state so that when we run our test, um, they do what they're supposed to, but actually we're not even interested in testing those, right? Remember, we're doing unit testing here. Um, and it gets even worse in the GWT world if some of those classes happen to have a JavaScript implementation only. It basically means that you can forget about testing any of this in Java, even though what you're testing might not actually use this. So I had a pretty nasty example um, just recently where I was trying to test um, a class that was using this date utils class. And um, in Java, these util classes have a tradition of being purely static. So every method in them um, has the static keyword. The problem here was that um, as well, I spent about a day finding out that this get format method calls get default daytime constants, which calls, um, which uses this local info class. Notice how we're still, everything is static. Once you move into the static world, you're basically stuck there. This local info class has a static field that creates a new instance of something which uses grid.create. And grid.create is basically the dead end for your unit test because there's just no way you can replace that with anything that exists in Java. Um, we create basically creates instances of classes in the JavaScript world. So even just to find this, like we spent about a day. Um, so what can we do about this? Basically, we can use, um, since we do not care about everything that our class on the test uh, interacts with during our unit test, um, we can change our code so that these classes become injectable. Right. So that our test case can tell our class on the test what we should pass through and what the class on the test should use. Now we can pass in, um, there's plenty of names for these things. Some call them mocks or fakes, um, which was a bit of a general term here that's test doubles. But basically we can pass something in that just will um, behave or have the same interface as the collaborators um, would but doesn't actually do anything. Right. And this is then how um, a usage of our date utils class would look. Right, so now it is not a static class anymore. Um, and in our constructor, we can pass in an instance of date utils or something that implements the same interface as date utils um, without actually being that class or the class that we can't instantiate. So now suddenly my class becomes testable, great. And um, yeah, we're going through this pretty quick. This is already the last of the pitfalls I ran into and really the biggest one. Um, don't worry, this last bit of code you'll see. Um, and you don't, you've actually seen most of it already. It is our application again, our little search box. Um, that displays different results. Now, what I've tried to do here, I hope this is, yeah, it's pretty visible. So I tried to color code the different lines and what their responsibility is in this program, right? So the yellow lines deal with displaying the information on the page. The green um, lines deal with talking to the server, getting the results back. And the red lines deal with processing those results to make them, to put them into a form that can be displayed. So how can we separate those three concerns? This is what we learned all when we learned about object orientation is that we should separate these concerns or concerns in general. So 
here's a possible way that we found that works pretty well for separating those concerns. And it is based on something called the model view presenter pattern, or it's not really a pattern, it's more than a pattern. Um, but basically, we, we want to separate our code into these three classes. We call them, we call them the view and the presenter and the service. Um, the view is basically what the user interacts with. And it's hopefully, it's, the idea would be that this is a very, very thin layer. It doesn't contain much complexity at all. It's mostly concerned about laying out things on the page and displaying them to the user and reacting to events that the user generates. So in this case, if our user types in a search query, and um, uh, basically the view receives this message, the, the on-click event, and just passes it on to the presenter. It doesn't really process that in any way. It passes it on to the presenter. Now the presenter is the place where we want to have all our logic. Right, so it will disable the search button while we're doing our query. It will talk to the back end. Um, once the result comes back, it will tell our view how to update itself in, pretty, in a lot of detail so that all this complex code that we saw before is basically inside this presenter. And now, why did we do that? The reason we did that is that if we use dependency injection on top of that, that we saw before, if we inject a view and a service into this presenter, we can now, in our tests, replace them with a mock. Right? So we don't depend on the view side of things anymore, on the user side. We don't depend on any server anymore. We have all our complexity in this one class, which now is pretty much unit testable. And basically, this will make your application way more unit testable. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't also test your view. And we just before lunch heard a very good talk about how we can test our views very efficiently. But when we do that, we don't really want to deal with the functionality of our application. We want to deal with the fact that, uh, well, we want to deal with or find out whether the information is displayed in the correct way. Right? We want to deal with the fact that maybe we have, um, maybe we have the same interface in French, right? And the word chercher is a lot longer than the word search. So will the word chercher still fit into the search button? But that has nothing to do with the actual code that performs the search and that displays the results. It has purely to do with the layout. So by separating these issues, we also get another benefit, which is that we can now maybe generate a view without a real presenter and without a real service. So maybe we can inject some canned data into our view and use that for testing. Right? So that would speed up um, the front end part of the testing quite a lot as well. And yes, in the end, so the conclusion pretty much for me during this one and a half years was that a lot of what I did was really not so much about writing tests. It was about getting the software to a point where it can be tested. And this is usually the really difficult part. And the way Google tries to approach it is to take engineers and put them into testing and make them talk to other engineers. Um, and it works, you know, sometimes better than in other times. But basically, we can spend a lot of effort trying to make something testable that really isn't. It really just isn't. And of course, you can argue that static methods are there for a purpose. And the designers of the Java language thought about why they, we should have static method, me, methods. Sorry. But we go through a lot of hoops. We jump jump through a lot of hoops for lots of reasons when we do software development. So why should we jump through a few hoops to make our applications easier to test? Because the amount of time we save by, making, by doing that is huge, right? And often you just don't notice it because your testing organization doesn't 
report onto the same structure as your development organization and they run on a separate budget so the development organization maybe never even realizes what they're costing. Right, so that was pretty much my message. Um, here are a couple of suggested suggestions if you are interested in learning more about all of this. Um, I can really recommend this clean code book. It's very entertaining read. It's very much about how to write clean software. Um, very, very nice. A couple of good articles about mocking, about dependency injection, and about these architectures we talked about, the model view presenter and model view control architectures. Um, I'd like to plug our, our blog that we have here at Google, um, where we try to update you with those nice little testing on a toilet episodes and other things. Um, and a couple of other GTAC talks that are also very interesting and entertaining and about similar subjects. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Um. Hello. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting talk, and uh, it, it's clear that the you know a testable application is an important part of uh, good testing. But uh, when you speak to these engineers and say, uh, now you've developed this great AJAX application, but now you have to refactor it uh, to use a pattern like MVP, uh, <laughs> how does that get received? So at Google, this actually works relatively well in general because the responsibility for the quality of an application lies with the development team. And the, the, the testing team is, here, is there to support them. But in the end, they will be the people who, who uh, will be held responsible if their application doesn't work in production or um, crashes all the time. So in general, we have... Um, we do have mixed experiences, and a lot of this, I mean, a lot of people would say that what I just said, you know, makes a lot of sense, and other people would argue against that, and so, of course, we end up in, in discussions. Um, until now, we've been, with the GWT world, we've been, it, the, the GWT developers have been very receptive, or the ones I've worked with, which... You know, it can mean many things. It can mean that, that um, my managers have allocated me to good projects that, you know, um, where I can have an impact. <laughs> or, um, um, so I don't know. I mean, there, there probably are teams out there but, um, that, you know, that don't believe too much in what we do. But we try to work with those where, that, where we know that they will take our advice seriously and hope that the good example will convince others. And yeah, but basically the, the, the Java world seems relatively open to unit testing, to, to design patterns, to all of these things that we try to advocate. So um, yeah, generally it sort of works out. Two questions. One quick one. Um, MVP versus MVC is—is is it anything other than a letter? Is there a reason? Um, there is a difference. Yes. I. Um, <laughs> well, to put it shortly, um, I had a slide about this which I removed. Damn. Um, <laughs> the the model view controller um, uh, pattern puts more logic into the view. So basically, in the, model view, in the classical model view controller pattern, the view is a listener of the model. It reacts to changes in the model, and the controller doesn't modify the view, it modifies a model. So some of the logic to deal with those changes will still be in the view, whereas what we're trying to say is that 
the presenter really has all the complexity. You can write a view class that basically has not no ifs and no for loops and nothing. Um, all of these should be in the presenter. So yeah. Well, I've been doing MVC wrong. Because uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that looked exactly like how I'd been doing it. Oh well, excellent. Um, I don't care much well, about how you call it as long yeah. as you do it right. <laughs> it just de declares kind of view elements. Um, and the other thing was, in terms of these uh, models or patterns, uh, does does GWT do anything to optimize for any particular ones? Does does it care if you're using an MVC parent? Um, it doesn't really force you to do it. There have been there are some attempts in GWT to come up with um, with a, a sort of pattern language that will basically generate the view for you from from uh, configuration files. I don't know how far that's gotten. Simon might know. Okay. Um, there have been some efforts in doing that, but really GWT is not. This is why I think we ran into so many problems is because um, GWT makes it easy to make those things wrong, like to get those things wrong. It doesn't really force you to do that. So for example, it, it contains tons of static methods itself. So if you just use it as it was intended to originally, you will, yeah, you will do that because you think, or basically that's what they show you how to use it, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just going to create something very untestable. Thank you. I'll say that again. Um, Ray Ryan uh, at Google I.O. Um, did a talk on uh, writing enterprise GWT applications, which covered a lot of architectural patterns that you can follow in order to write a maintainable, testable GWT application. Thank you, Zimmer. Yeah, so Ray Ryan. Any more questions? Um, yeah, with, with my testing hat on, I've always felt that uh, um, the developer should have primary responsibility for the testing of, of what he's writing. And with my developer hat on, I don't really want any tool to sully, if you like, my code and have to make allowances for it. Do you not feel that maybe um, we should somehow have better tools to allow us to mock objects without having to um, alter our code to allow for that? I totally agree with you. We should have better tools that allow us to. So the, the one problem I have with dependency injection is that it kind of breaks encapsulation a little bit. So we we have to um, tell the application what it's using, and maybe the outside world shouldn't even have to care. What I'm presenting is the pra pragmatic approach. But you're perfectly right. Um, we should come up with better tools. Um, having also other things like you know faster quit tests would be a big help as well, or faster uh, web driver tests would be a big help as well. But you know, I mean, in the current situation and the way we are, we just realized that people are not writing unit tests or not very useful unit tests or very expensive unit tests that don't really add much value. So, yeah, with the current tool set. And the current situation, we feel like this is a one way to go that hopefully will improve things. But yeah, please, everybody, like keep developing better tools for us. We'll try so as well. For marking, do you have a centralized marking service, or every developer build their own marks because if there are multiple versions of marks for the same thing, they will be coming to inconsistency. And the follow-up question is, how much effort does this marking take? And is it easy to maintain or to upgrade with the actual services? Right. So um, actually, with, um, with Java, we were in a very happy situation that we have three very good mocking frameworks that are open source and available. Um, there's JMock, there's EasyMock, and there is Mokito. And 
they basically make it very easy to create your mocks on the fly just for your test case. You don't have to check them in in many cases. You can just use them right there and then create a new one for your other test. So you never really run into the... And they're created basically dynamically based on, on reflection information. So they will always be up to date. And yeah, that helps us a lot. Yeah, but yes, I mean, if you want to mock or basically generate um, something by hand, yes, you will definitely run into that problem. I'll repeat the question. <laughs> Hello? Okay, great. Yeah, my kid, I, I'm from Tel Aviv, my kid asked me to bring him back um, some three-letter acronym thing, some sort of Game Boy. I don't even know what he's talking about. So, uh, Anyway, um, you, you mentioned that it took you a day to find the problem with the static... Um, static wit um, initializer that was weighed down yeah. in the object hierarchy. Okay. And there's a couple of other issues that you talked about that um, are kinetic, connected with just basically the static state of the code. So has anybody in the room actually tried to do static analysis of Java classes or Java um, code to try and detect these problems and save people like yourself and me who join a, a project that's been around for a while. It's full of legacy code, and we don't really want to spend those days to find out why it's really hard to mock out um, for, for testing purposes. Of course, con considering this is the test automation conference, that's really what we should be doing. Um, I personally haven't tried. We've been just, yes, like we've been thinking about some things along those lines. But we haven't tried it yet. Has anybody tried it? Uh, Simon has. It's conveniently at the other end of the room. <laughs> Hello. Yep. I uh, wrote a tool that used QDocs to parse the source of a uh, Java code base. Um, and then what it would do is it would output a juice module, um, uh, an interface containing every single static method a juice module uh, which then wired up that interface to an implementation that delegated down to the static implementations. Um, so the idea was that you wouldn't have to remove all the statics from your code base, but you had a mechanism where you could pass them in on demand. Thank you. Well, I haven't actually built anything myself, but I'm fairly certain that's what uh, the testability explorer is supposed to do, um, which I don't know if anyone who's worked on that is here, but I assume they would have said so if they were. Uh, it's another Google project. I think Misko Hevery is at least partly responsible. And yeah, as far as I know, it's a static analysis for Java to try to determine the testability of code. Yep. So if you're interested in that, look up that. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Yeah, so Testability Explorer will cover um, some things. It will identify some poor development styles, such as having lots of static calls. I don't think it covers GWT-specific things, but it would be quite cool to extend that to do GWT-specific stuff. All right, I'll say thank you very much, Nicholas, then. Um, can we have you back in the room by just before half past? You've got time for a quick loo break or a bottle of Coke, but not too many cigarettes. So thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you.